Hey folks, Brother Peter with tidbits from the Word. Have you ever gave much thought about the origin of the Bible? The Bible is God's personal book to mankind. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost had prepared before the world was made the fact that they were going to have a book that was going to chronicle or catalog every event that has taken place on this earth. Even the event of God speaking the earth into existence. And it was something done by God instantly. It was spoke into existence. And then he decorated it and that was when days came in and nights and hours. And the Bible portrays Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as the Savior of this world, this very world that he helped create and did create and cast it out into the eons of time into the galaxy that it's in. And uh, behind and beneath the Bible and above the Bible and beyond the Bible is God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost. Those three are always in the picture before anything else was in the picture. And then, so the Bible is God's written revelation. Now, he could speak it, and he has spoke. In many times past, he has spoke. But he has left this now in reading for you and I, because he no longer speaks audibly like he did to the children of Israel. And he speaks now through his Bible. And the Bible is God's written revelation. And uh, it, it is His will and testimony for all men that they read and understand what He wrote in this book. And this book is for us. It is an eternal theme, yet it's present. It's just like picking up the newspaper and reading today's news. It's a, it's a past, present, and future reading. It tells of the past, tells of the present, and reveals is the revelation of the future and the will of men. Its eternal theme is salvation. That's the eternal theme of the Bible. The whole Bible was written that mankind could know salvation and know the way of God. Now the Old Testament was tough times to live in and we're going to cover the Old Testament first just a little bit. The Bible contains 66 books. And it was written by some 40 authors over a period of 1,600 years. Uh, this is called, I forget what it's called. Uh, there's a name for studying that, and I forgot what it's called now. But And it, it's a system that you study. And I, I did that system. I studied it. And um, so we have the Old Testament. It was written mostly in Hebrew. And Hebrew were the children of God. He chose a group of people. And he called them Hebrews. And they were the first Jews. Uh, some of the short passages were written in Aramaic. Because of where they were writing the Bible. Where and who was writing it during that period of time. Covered the fact that it was over there in that country. And so... Uh, Aramatic. About a hundred years or more before Christian era, the entire Old Testament was translated into the Greek language. Now you remember the Greeks and the Romans uh, had their language and much of it was written. You know, you remember that Paul the Apostle who wrote 13 books was a Roman and he knew Roman and he knew Greek and he knew Hebrew. He knew it all. And remember, our English Bible is a translation or a transliteration of those three languages, the Arabic and the Hebrew and, uh, and the Roman. And the word uh, Bible comes from the word which was, in those Bible days, was called Biblia. It was the Biblia. And uh, Biblios, actually. And the word uh, Testament means covenant. Or the covenant in the Bible, when God talked about a covenant, he talked about an agreement. He made an agreement. The Bible is an agreement 
to Christian people. That they will, if they will study it and learn it, that they can follow it. And that's what God wants us to do. The, the Old Testament covenant was with man and his salvation before Christ came. The New Testament is the uh, agreement that God made with man about his salvation through his son, Jesus Christ. He tells us about that agreement in there. He said, I have sent my son in these last days, and he is going to testify of me and be in my stead on the earth. And he was. Jesus came as God in the flesh. In the Old Testament, we find the covenant of the law. In the New Testament, we find the covenant of grace, which came through Jesus Christ. One led unto the other. Galatians 3, 17 through 25. Now, the old commenced what the new completes. What the old started, and when it commenced, it ended there in Revelation. Uh, I mean, in... Uh, uh, Malachi, where it ended there in Malachi, it ended and we picked up in the book of Matthew and we came on. And the old gathered around Sinai, but the new gathered around Calvary. Now Mount Sinai was the place where God spoke from. Mount Sinai was the mountain where Moses went up on and the burning bush spoke to him. By the way, as we have studied the New Testament, we find out that that speaking in that burning bush was Jesus at that point in time came and revealed himself in that burning bush, in that fire. And that was on Mount Sinai. Now we see the New Testament around Calvary, which is around the cross. And the old uh, associated with Moses, but the new associates with Christ. And John 1 and 17, we find that. And the author, uh, the authors, they were kings. Some kings wrote. Some of them were princes. Some were poets. Some were philosophers. Some were prophets. Some were statesmen. Uh, and some were learned in all the arts of the time and others were unschooled fishermen. I, I really, it offends me to hear that when uh, they, uh, in the day of Pentecost, that the uh, notable men of the time said, these are unlearned men. Hey, these were the most learned men on the planet. Those fishermen that Jesus called were the most learned men on the planet. They knew they had to get up early. They knew they had to be on the water a certain time. They knew they had to fish in a certain place. They knew when they got back, they had to mend their nets, no matter how tired they were, that they had dumped their fish, they had cleaned their fish, they had got them out of the boat, they had got them to market, and they came back. But before they could rest, they had to mend their nets. So, Jesus was that type of person. He did not rest until he was forced to rest. That's the way fishermen are. Other books soon are outdated, but the book spans centuries. This book, the Bible, spans centuries. Uh, it, uh, most books are uh, adapted to age, but old and young alike love this book. This book is written to the youngest child that can pick it up and read it, to the oldest man before he closes his eyes and goes to heaven can read it. And most books are uh, provincial and only interested to people in whose language it is written. And, uh, but not this book. No one ever steps, stops to think, it was written in what are now dead languages. It was not written in dead languages in the sense of the word. It was written in the past, the present, and the future. It is a today book. The Bible is a today book. The Old Testament begins with God, Genesis 1.1. That's the, the, the very beginning of the past is Genesis 1.1. The New Testament begins with Christ in Matthew 1.1. 1, 1. 
Now that's the beginning of the New Testament. That's the beginning of the new spiritual era in the world of salvation. And then from Adam to Abraham, we have the history of the human race. And from Abraham to Christ, we have the history of the chosen race. So even though there was a general human race, there was a chosen race among that human race. They were called the Hebrews. Uh, from, from, on, from, from Christ on, we have the history of the church. Now the church is the way and the means that God has used to keep himself in the forefront of the average everyday man. He's allowed a thing uh, to be in the world called the church building. It's just like the storefront. You go to get groceries from the storefront. Or you go to get gro uh, mechanic work done at the front of a garage. Or you go get things done at different places. But Christ is where you come and get the spiritual things for your life. And Christ is in the New Testament of the Bible. Most people not knowledge of the history is like a string of pearls or a, a handful of pearls without a string. And uh, did you notice that when pearls are put together, they're put together with little ones on the side and then they come down bigger, 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 and then there's a big one in the middle. On both sides, they lay the pearls out and they even them out and then they make a necklace that's even and it's beautiful and it has it has, it's sized. Now if you just got a handful of pearls, you got a handful of nothing until you put it together properly. And uh, let's look at the historian, the statement that seems to be especially true of the Bible history. Many people know the Bible characters and the principal events, but they are hopelessly lost when they are called upon to connect the stories. That's like that handful of pearls. To connect them and put them in order so that they're beautiful. So we need to know anyone who has experienced the thrill of learning how to place individual characters in their right setting as the place the time can realize the difference it makes in an enjoyment of the word. So we need to know when the disciples were called, who they were called. Who called the first ones? Jesus did. He just walked by the ship. You know what he said? Follow me. They left their father and they followed him. They left their ships and they owned their ships. And they left their ships and they left and gave everything to their father and they walked away. Not only that, they walked away from their father. Their earthly father. They just up and walked away from their earthly father. That one man said to Jesus, let me bury my father first. What he was saying is I want to hang around till my father dies, and when he dies, I'll bury him, and then I'll come and go with you. And Jesus said, no. If you're not willing to leave your father now, don't bother to come and try to follow me after your daddy dies. Because I'm asking you now to come, but you decide you don't want to come now, so don't come now. Don't come then either. So you're out of the picture. So pick up the pearls of Scripture, String them into autumn from Genesis to Revelation so that you can think through the Bible story. How do you think through the Bible story? What was the first thing in the Old Testament? It was the law. The law was given. And the people had to uh, uh, live by the laws. And there was five main laws in that time. And then we found that the... Uh, 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 books, the five books of law, excuse me, five main books of law. I should have left the book, I left the books out. And then we had the 12 historical books. That's the 12 history books. Uh, each one is a history book about people, about mankind, and especially the children of Israel. And then we had six prophetical books. These are books that are prophetical. They prophesy uh, what is going to be done and of course they recap some of the things that have been done and, and then we have the prophetical there's 16 of those those are prophesying books 16 books that prophesy about Jesus coming about the Messiah 
And then we have uh, four major books. And then on top of that, we have four minor books. I'm making out 12 books there. And so the New Testament books, we're going to look at those. They were written uh, to reveal to us the character and the teaching of Jesus Christ in the flesh as he came on the earth as the mentor of the new covenant. See, the New Testament was a new covenant. The law was finished. When Jesus died on the cross and went and rent the veil in half, walked down through hell and paradise, he preached across the top of hell, and then he walked into paradise, and he preached in paradise. And he took those that were captive in paradise and brought them with him up and stopped on the earth, picked his blood up, and took it and put it on the altar before the Father. And when he did that, then he came back and got those, uh, those people who were discipled in the Old Testament. They were Old Testament disciples and apostles and prophets and all of those, and he took them to heaven too in that event. And, and by the last eight men, four of whom Matthew, John, Peter, Paul were apostles, two, uh, Mark and Luke, they were companions to the apostles. And James and Jude were brothers of Jesus. The books were written at various times during the second half of the first century. The first thousand years, uh, the the uh, Bible was written, finished, Mark finished, end, the end. And uh, the books of the New Testament may be uh, grouped as thus. There was four Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They were the four Gospels. And then we had the history. And there's one book of history. And then uh, Acts. And then we have the prophecy and there's one book of prophecy. And we have the epistles. And there are 21 epistles. And what are the epistles? The epistles are the books written by the apostles. And those books contain a way of life that God would have us to live as Christians. Now Paul, and it's, these are called, there are 13 of these, and they are called the Pauline epistles, that Paul wrote these. And uh, the general, and there are eight general epistles. And God, uh, there is, it, it is God, comma, man, comma, sin, comma, redemption, comma, justification, comma, sanctification, comma, glorification, semicolon, and in two words, grace and glory. <laughs> grace and glory. <coughs> I think, uh, as, as a human being, I study um, a little bit of uh, the war between the states, the Civil War, and uh, how grace, some of those men had graceful times. And then the great glory they had at the end of the battle and in one word, Jesus Christ is the grace and the glory that we need. The reflection in two words, grace and glory. In one word, Jesus, he is grace and glory. A Christ quotes from 22 Old Testament books in Matthew. Just think, in Matthew, he quotes from 22 Old Testament books. Do you know what he's doing? He's putting his stamp of approval on 22 of those Old Testament books. You say, what about the rest? The rest had his stamp too. 19 times in Mark, 15 times in Luke, 25 times in John, and 11 times in others. In the book of Hebrew, he quotes the Old Testament quotation of allusions 85 times. That's the rest of the Bible that he quotes about. 85 times he alludes to the Old Testament. 
and to the writings of the Old Testament. In Revelations now, 245 times the uh, Old Testament is alluded to. In 245 times. Uh, the number of verses in the Bible are 31,102. That's how many verses there are in the Bible. If you want to break it down into words, the number of words is 775,693. That's how many words there is. The longest uh, book in the Bible is Psalm 119. The uh, shortest chapter in the Bible is Psalm 117. And uh, it is a curious fact that Ezra 721 contains all the letters of the alphabet except J. I remember a few years back, I was a young Christian and I was studying, and I was studying facts and things like that, and one of those things, this was one of the facts that we studied. And the longest verse is in Ezra, chapter 8 and verse 9, and the shortest verse is John 11:35. Now I can't quote you right now, Ezra 8 and 9, but I can quote you 11:35. Of John, Jesus wept. And that is probably the biggest statement in the whole Bible. That the very Son of God, Jesus, wept. He wept over Jerusalem. He wept over His people. He wept over the situation the world was in. He wept over the complexity of everything that was happening in His day. And He wept over that. The longest book in the Old Testament is Psalms, and the longest book in the New Testament is Luke. And Luke, by the way, was an erudite writer. He was like an archer that won the world championship. See, my pastor has won it twice. He won world champion twice in archery. Ah, uh, I don't know. I guess Luke's probably got a pretty good stand in here, but... I don't know if he ever would have came up twice against something. But he does back up much that he says by one or two or three witnesses all the time. Uh, Luke was a, he didn't say anything that he didn't back up. Everything in the book of Luke is backed up by something else. And uh, we know the longest verse in Esther. All right, the 12 principal things. Uh, that we know uh, that places around which the history of the Old Testament is written. Uh, where did we start? We started in the Garden of Eden where God made man and placed him in the garden. He made all the animals next and he made many things. And then he made him a helpmate, a woman. And then uh, the next big thing that we see in the Bible after Eden was Ararat. What was Ararat? That was when the ark landed. That was after the flood. That was after the annihilation of all mankind except uh, a lot and his, his um, uh, Noah, excuse me, Noah and his wife and his sons, eight people were saved during that period of time and one of them was going to be the one of them carried the devil with him to start back up that revolution that the devil has. And uh, there are 12 principal places around which history of the Old Testament is written. And that was, first it was in Eden, then it was Ararat, and then Babel. Isn't it something how God chose to write the worst? To write the worst. He didn't have to say, about how many people there was living for him. How good things were in this place or that place. No, he came down to see. As a matter of fact, he didn't have to come down to see. The Bible said it came up to him. It was a stench in his nostrils that Babylon was being built. That they were building a tower to heaven and would have succeeded in building it higher than any other thing on the earth. And the, uh, the tower was not the problem. The problem was is they left God, the God of heaven, out. And they thought that they could reach into heaven and get God by their works. 
You cannot, by your works, get anything. And it was by their works that they fell. And, and God said, hey, I'm not accepting your works. I'm not accepting that Tower of Babel. Be it 26 miles high and 26 miles across it. I'm not accepting it. No matter what. And then we see Ur of the Chaldees. Well, what happened there in Ur of the, Ur of the Chaldees? That was an unplay. God visited that place. And who did he visit? He visited a man named Abraham. God in the Old Testament, through the Old Testament, came down and visited individuals at sundry times or different times. He came and visited individuals. And he came down and he visited Abraham. He said, Abraham, I'm fixing to choose you and you are going to be the father. Uh, he said, look into the heavens and see what you see. Abraham looked into the heavens and he said, I see stars with a number that cannot be counted. And God said to him, Abraham, I'm going to make of you that many people. I'm going to make of you a nations that cannot be counted, people that cannot be counted. There'll be so many that can't be counted. And then we see the time in Egypt where God sent Joseph to Egypt. What a trek that was. That Joseph was sold into slavery. He throwed in a pit. Took out. Sold, sold into slavery. Uh, followed God to the last degree that when a lady came after him and snatched his robe off that he ran from there and he said, I will not sin. I will not sin against the master that I have and I not will sin against the God that I follow. And he would not sin. He left his robe and ran. And because of that, he ended up in prison. And then we see the Sinai incident. And in the wilderness. And how they were in Canaan. And how that Joshua had to come along. And Joshua chided them to follow God. But they wouldn't listen. They still wouldn't listen. So we see that they went into captivity in Assyria. So they were captive of the Assyrians. Wicked people. Wicked, wicked, double wicked people. And they were captive of those Assyrians. And then uh, we saw they had in Babylon more captivity. Another set of wicked people. A wicked system. And then in Canaan. That was in Palestine. They returned there, but they were still in exile. They still had not come in. And you remember when the spies went out and came back. The two they should have listened to, Joshua and Caleb. By the way, do you know before that, that there's an incident back in the Bible where God said for them to take a piece of land and they marched down there to take it and God sent a swarm of bees in there and God ran all the people out with the bees and they ran and left. They left their food on the table. And the Israelites walked in there sat down at those people's table and ate the food they set on the table. Spent their gold, ate their food, wore their clothes. God just did that. And God would have done that. God had a plan if they had only had faith and said, we'll take it. When they had walked up to the, to the door, to the gate, and said, open, the gate would have opened. And God would have sent... He would clean those giants out of there and those people. They probably wouldn't have to shoot an arrow or have one drop of physical human fighting. God would have done it for them. Now, the Old Testament principle, prison, the Old Testament principle facts we have just covered. Our time's about come and gone, so we're going to do a quick review of this before we go into the New Testament. What we just covered was the creation, Genesis 1, 1 through Genesis 2 and 3. The fall of man, Genesis 3. The diluge, remember, we talked about Noah. And that was the great diluge. And then we talked about the Tower of Babel, chapter 11, 1 through 9. The call of Abraham, Genesis 11, 10 and 12 through 3. Did you know that that's only about the fifth thing in consecu consecutively that happened in the world during that period of time but God made a plan for his people 
in this fifth period of time when he called Abraham. Descendants of into Egypt. Then they went into Egypt. Remember, they were there some 400 to 450 years. They walked in there, 70 souls, just 70 Hebrew people walked into Egypt and left with over 3 million, nearly 4 million people when they walked out of there 400 years later. And uh, uh, the descent into Egypt is in Genesis 46 and 47, and the Exodus is in Exodus 7 and 12, how the Exodus is. And then you remember the Passover, and that happened while they were still there. Now this is a very, very, very important thing to study in Exodus chapter 12, the Passover lamb. This is when they had to take the blood of the lamb, put it on the doorpost, and that uh, death angel that was going to kill the oldest child in every family. Uh, a lot of people said, well, they killed the babies. No, God did not kill the babies there. He killed the oldest child. He killed, he killed the firstborn. The firstborn. When you see that movie on TV, it's incorrect. Giving the law. In Exodus, God gave the law. Now, he knew that the people could not follow the law. But the law was an example given so they could see how far away from the law they really were in, a way, in degradation. We see the wilderness wandering in Numbers chapter 13 and 14. We see the conquest of the promised land by Joshua. Now, why did Joshua win that battle? Because he prayed to God. And you know that he was so tired holding his hands up praying that, that uh, two people had to come along beside him and hold his arms up. Whenever he put his arms down, they lost in the battle. When he put them back up, they won. When they came down, they lost. When he put them back up, they, came, they won. So two fellows came up beside him and held his arms up. In the wilderness wanderings, 13 and 14. Conquest of the promised land, Joshua 11. The dark ages chosen by the people in Judges. The anointing of Saul as king in 1 Samuel. The golden age of Israel under David and Solomon, the united kingdom in 2 Samuel, 1 Kings. And that was a blessed time for a certain group of Hebrew children, of the Jewish children, that were in the area where David was king and in that part of the land. And God had come and blessed David as king. And, 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 and then the kingdom got divided after that. And the kingdom was divided. Israel and Judah were separated from each other for a time. And we see the captivity again. Second Kings 17.25 The people brought under wicked captivity again because they rejected God. And then we see the return of the people in the book of Ezra. And that we're going to end our Old Testament study right there in, with the book of Ezra. And I will see you next time. And we're going to be in the New Testament next time. Bye-bye.